Ja, ich äh, bin heute Morgen um 5 Uhr aufgestanden aus Düsseldorf gekommen und bin immer noch so an der, an der Regener Regenerierung, hatte eine lange Debatte. I had a long debate till at midnight and uh, I woke up at 5 o'clock and had to go to the airport. Um, in preparing my contribution, I was torn in between disillusioning of the young generation or appearing as a wise old man, uh, or perhaps learning that dreams are not illusions or whatsoever. So I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with a, this is actually a, a painting um, which I used in the crisis time of Lufthansa after 9-11, uh, when the organization didn't know where to go. And I was head of the operation, 30,000 people, uh, and, uh, and this boat of the Medusa uh, is, is a very famous painting where you have the despair on the left side and the hope uh, on, on the right side. Um, and I would like to, to use that as kind of a polarity in which I do also my contribution and when I disillusion somebody, please uh, apologize me, I don't mean it very bad. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a skeptical optimist, if I might say so. In your brochure there is written, there is a well-educated and digitally, digitally engaged generation that is currently entering the workplace around the world and it will create the decision makers of tomorrow, the so-called Generation Y. Well, I need to put some water into that wine first. Um, if I look at the Generation Y, I don't know how it is in Britain or in France or in the US, I see a very different picture. And I would like to start with my first encounter with the Vision Y project team, because when I met them, uh, I said to them, are you aware that 20% of the Generation Y is the so-called losers of education? who never enter the workforce in a proper way, who never have decent work. And they, the young students looked at me, some of them are sitting here with big eyes, and said, no, you are not aware that this Generation Y. And I said, yes, but it is Generation Y. So in research, and now we can debate research, reveals to once this made disturbing results among students in Germany. The dominance of financial and material values increased from 1995 from 31% to 73% in 2013. 50% of the students see Germany overstretched with migration and not in demand of foreign experts and skilled workers, not to say somebody who is fugitive. And there is an increasingly dominance of the old role model the men as the family's sole breadwinner in Fratest study 2013. The 12th student survey 2014, well debated in the country, dramatically shrinking political interest. 1983, 54%, 1993, 46%, 2010, 37%, uh, 2014, 24%. And the 12th student survey said the increase of instable Democrats amongst young students is from 23 to 39%, and the decrease of stable Democrats from 71 to 48%. Now, those numbers can be debated. I just put them on the table and confront them with there is a generation Y entering the workplace all around the world, the decision makers of tomorrow. Perhaps yes, perhaps no. The truth is probably <coughs> somewhere in between. And is that a problem? Yes and no. Yes, 
because obviously there are different perceptions and views about the generation Y. It's not a problem because 30% is still a significant amount of students who can change the world. So I, I so we really can 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 debate that now. And that is something I really would, would like to where I would like to take the myth or the fake from this know of generation Y and say, come on, be a little bit more down to earth. There are relevant segments in this generation which are apolitical, which are not interested, which are perhaps even returning to values where some of us might think there are old values and not feasible values anymore in modern times, and there are other people who are not. If you ask young graduates what they want to do in the labor market, there was a big study and 40% said public service is the preferred employer. Now, nothing against being a civil servant. That's a very important role. But 40% say that is my preferred employer. Another 15% say agencies very close to public service are their preferred employer cultural agencies, and so on. Now we are at 55. 20% say large corporations are the preferred employer. Now we are not at 55%, we are at 75%. And we definitely, well I definitely would say, big corporations are not necessarily the ones who are doing the big true progress. So uh, also from that triangle, um, you would say generation Y is a little bit diminishing from 100% to 25%. <laughs> now, if you look at another issue, and I'm a deep believer in entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship, not just running a, a, a developing a business, but doing my own thing. Have my own idea, create things. Now, and, and running a business can be a social business, can be a technological business, whatever, it can be a business business. Our country, and that's the only thing I really can talk about, is shortly before France, one of the lowest of countries. Uh, this is a chart, a percentage of, 18, of population between 18 and 64, who is currently an owner-manager of a new business but not longer than 42 months. So we are really in a deep, deep problem. And if you look that only 4% of the board members of large stock-listed enterprises ever had entrepreneurial experience, you see about the role model. And out of these foundations, only 8% have to do with technology in a country where we depend deeply on that issue. So I'm just debating a little bit this notion of Generation Y. Um, and, and come to a point where I say, let's take a very down-to-earth view on that. Let me come to my second point, after talking a little bit about Generation Y. Uh, change makers. Is it also a fake to go on the global level? Do we have to go to Kathmandu to start to change the world? Now that is an interesting point because naturally a lot of social issues and projects deal with the foreign countries. That's like in the 18th, 19th century when, when, when the British counts went over to Africa and started their expeditions. And their own country was in the deep ship. So the issue of do I have to go on a global meta level to change the world or cleaning the own house is very interesting. Now, I'm reading some of the initiative ideas Resource efficient production, business management optimizing stakeholder value, 
Global Education Initiative, Free Education Choice, Global Eco-Social Market Economy, Democratize United Nations. Um, that comes to the point when I was asking the young students, do you know that 20% of your own generation in this country are losers in education? And if you really look at the reality, you know that in companies, if you have a Turkish name, you have only one third of a chance to get to an interview in this country. And uh, somebody with a German name has a three times higher probability to get invited. Or if you look at the schools in the big cities in Germany, it's like in Detroit or in New York, segregated schools. 70% uh, of all schools uh, with migrants are segregated, and in middle-sized middle towns, 40%. 40% of all international students in this country say they perceive discrimination. In Great Britain, it's 28%. PhDs with the origin out of the upper class or upper middle class have a two and a half time higher probability to come up to the ranks of the executive than PhDs from the working class. 66% of all female managers surveyed by the Association of Geführungskräfte say they are perceiving occupational discrimination in their job. Only 15% of all companies which provide apprenticeship systems have migrant youth amongst their apprentices. And 1% of the German population owns one-third of Germany's wealth. So, the question is, do I have to go so far abroad to change the world? <coughs> and an interesting point also, which I noted, the higher in status, and Professor Rademacher, you said though, people are explaining their own world <laughs> to justify their existence. The higher in status, the more justification of social difference. So you see that members of the upper class say in a significant higher amount, probably double as much as the working class, social differences are justified. So a lot of change in this world or in the local world or in the global world has to do what's happening up here. What are the deep ingrained stereotypes and beliefs which people carry with them? And that is one of the reasons, because that is not really addressed or attacked or whatsoever, that many of these projects fail. Because actually it's not only the goodwill, it's also the bad will, which is doing good things, or supposedly good things. And to, to be frank, this then also means that we talk about what is learning. Um, and the social process of young people are socialized, how they learn, or the dressage along the whole learning journey. And a key issue, for example, for change, and that is very, very fruitful that you undertake that project. I look more here because here, obviously, the younger generation is sitting here, and over there is the middle-aged <laughs> population. <laughs> that do universities, do schools, encourage a critical mass of students to confront themselves with different social realities? Because that is the place where this, by history, and by purpose is happening more often is the university. 
So how much confrontation with different social realities, or is a university using a project like yours as an alibi to say we do it? I call it the uh, Abteilung für das Gute. Like many corporations have corporate responsibility units, <laughs> which I call the departments for the good. And the rest of the organization can work in the old modus operandi. <laughs> why, why am I a fan uh, of Karl Popp? Means why, I'm, why am I a skeptical optimist? Uh, or why do I favor that way of changing things? And because, well, he says there is no ideal state in society and organization. It is better to change the world in little steps, he calls it piecemeal engineering, or to safeguard that the world does not get worse. And this, is, this notion of progress <coughs> is a very difficult because we see a lot of things in this world where it gets worse. Where it's already progress to avoid getting worse. So, because usually we think everything only, if it's, if it's being adding up, is good and progress. Also avoiding that it's dropping even more down uh, is, is progress. And each problem-solving approach can create bigger problems than they solve. That's why good things being done very often produce bad results. Just think about what's happening with abortion issue in the US, or just think about the, the, the prohibition of alcohol uh, once in a while in history, and, and, and so on. And Popper says ethics is problem solving of social issues. It's not values and norms. It's detecting and changing false rules of the game, step by step. And so actually he takes a systemic view of change when he talks <coughs> about the rules of the game. Because if you don't change the rules of the game, how the whole water system is being done in this state of Naples, if you just send the people to clean the river, it's a good deed, but it's increasing the problem. And he says also critical thinking is crucial for the improvement of states. And that boils down, down to the role of very much for universities, where, where I'm deeply concerned that in, 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 in implementing the Bologna reform, uh, at a certain point, we industrialized learning uh, in our society. Now, Karl Popper, he said a beautiful word, which, which explains his ideology, idea very clearly. How can we build our institutions in a way that even incapable and corrupt despots cannot cause too much damage? He doesn't say, how do we improve institutions? So then how do we build that they cannot do any damage? He says, not too much damage. <laughs> he even says, some damage will be done anyway. So he doesn't talk about a better world. He doesn't talk an ideal to achieve, but to avoid the worse. Now, if as a side effect, true progress is happening, he would take it into account. But he takes first a skeptical view on things. That naturally is not a very attractive idea for this certain percentage of the younger generation which calls themselves Generation Y. Because naturally, and if I remember when I was young, I had so many ideals in my head how I wanted to improve the world and make it better. And that was the driver of my professional and personal development. Idealism and ideals are very often the drivers, especially for the young generation. And, and as we get older, we become probably more cynical. 
and I hope you don't get me as a cynic, uh, but as somebody who just says being skeptical still can help you to come to your ideal. Popper and in myself, I, I claim that kind of change is muddling through. Uh, that's, that's the assumption in, 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 which, in which I work, and um, I would like to give you three examples by having ideals but muddling through how it worked or did not work. An interesting point, and that was when I, when I, when I was responsible for but I was not responsible. I was formally responsible for 30,000 people at Lufthansa in 90, after 9-11. And you can imagine it's, it's a very easy thing if you lose production capacity of 30% to ground 30% of the aircraft in the desert of Arizona. That is a very trivial solution. Now you also can make a trivial solution in, 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 in downsizing 30% of your staff. Uh, and downsizing 30% of your staff means survival for the, for the, for the company, but means 30,000 on the street and 30,000 uh, individual destinies. So that was a difficult situation. And, and actually you had, you had days where the, the flights, the planned flights were completely empty. And the next day it was filled by 60%, and the next day it was filled by 15%. There was no planning available. <coughs> uh, so you had actually a, a phase of six to eight months where you muddled your way through just by, by putting a, step, a, 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 a shoe in the door and see what happened. And on the other hand, you had, you had many, many people who looked for their fortunes and for the, the, their destiny, and you couldn't tell them because you didn't have a solution. Because the situation was so complex that you could not say, we do this and this and this, and then this and this is happening, and then we secure your jobs. So we were navigating in water, which we didn't know how deep the water is. We were navigating in the night, and the night didn't have any stars, and there was no compass. And the only thing we had, or I had, was myself. And that was trying to, to tell the people, I am there and I'm with you. And at a certain point I discovered that they didn't believe me. And then I understood in a late night why they didn't believe me. <laughs> because they thought, Mr. Saddleberger can take, with his professional career, open the door and leave the company and leave us. And so the only thing I could do was, I'm staying with you till the crisis is over. And I said that publicly. So I kind of gave my destiny into the hand of the complex situation. Quota for women in, in management. Now that is a 20 year journey, which I had. I think in 1992, for the first time, I had the idea. And then I muddled my way through to this issue of career fairness for men and for women. And I muddled my way through, through, the, through mentoring programs and coaching programs and nothing worked. That was in the 90s. In the late 90s, self-marketing activities for women uh, and negotiation training. Because part of the gender pay gap is obviously, as literature says, uh, influenced by the poor negotiation capabilities of women. <laughs> so we went that muddling through. And in Continental, for the first time, uh, I set goals. And things got a little bit better. Uh, and then, 18 years after my first thought about a quota, 18 years later, I, I introduced that at Deutsche Telekom, 2010. So what I mean is, muddling through means that sometimes you carry an idea with yourself, which you think is right, through many, many years and decades, 
till the right time comes, which you obviously cannot influence. And on Friday, the German parliament is discussing the legal quota. And I say, when this comes true, I take a glass of good Riesling <laughs> and sit there and think about the last 20 years. Then there is another thing which I'm carrying with me since many years. That's the notion of the democratic organization. Uh, it was when I was a young trainer in, in Daimler uh, in the 70s, I experimented already with self-steered organizations and self-steered learning environments, with goal agreements for development and for learning and so on. It failed, didn't work. Uh, actually, I wrote a book about the failure, uh, my first one. A uh, very critical, self-critical book. And I, I always experimented over the time with, with uh, hierarchy, poor uh, learning networks, uh, in, in the innovation speedboats of Deutsche Telekom, uh, of re significantly reduced hierarchy uh, in one or the other unit we tried to elect leaders from through the members whatsoever. So I'm still muddling through with that topic. I had the chance, uh, together with uh, Professor Welpe and Dr. Bös, to, to do a big conference at the Technical University. Uh, and Professor Arman, you also said it's, a, it's the right place that universities take, take such a controversial topic. Now what I say is, I do not know if this is the right way. But the point is, if we do not experiment with the issue, we somehow never find out if it's improving a little bit or if it makes it making things worse or whatsoever. Let me come to an end. I'm a little bit long. Probably in this democratic enterprise, it's, it will not be the ideal solution. We probably will have a, 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 a competition of systems for mercenary organizations, old, old traditional ocean liners, Agile shadow organizations, what I call democratic fresh Mittelstand, uh, all those hybrid internet giants which are very, very feudal at the top and, and very democratic uh, in, the, in the stomach of the, of the organization. But this is, those are kind of three <coughs> things where, I'm, where I kind of feel my approach to change is the muddling through over years, have an unprecise idea but a good aspiration in my head and somehow fail and sometimes, sometimes win. Let me come to end. Map and territory of change and transformation. And if we look at the world of better progress, you can think about moral appeals. The world has to become better or not become worse. You, you can engage in a discourse like you do it here, like we do it here, where we hopefully start not just to lecture, but to debate the issues. You can do research, <coughs> go deep into the issue, or you start to experiment in real life territory not knowing how things come out at the end. And experimenting in real life the territory means also experimenting with, it, with yourself. It's not just a business lab, it's not just a future lab, it's also your personal lab or my personal lab, because that means what do I do in that business? What do I do in that future? Uh, and how will I be? What will my identity be? And how I, am I now? So this experimenting in real life territories, territories and then perhaps we can start to prototype some new micro worlds to see if things are working out. Thank you very much.